Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Um, yeah. Wait, wait, wait. Is this recording? Let me just see. Okay, I think it is recording and, and transcribing. Um, good day, everyone. Um, my name is Tobani. I'm an associate professor here at the University of Johannesburg. Um, thank you so much for joining us on what we know is quite a busy week um, all over the South African and Southern African Academy. Um, we're really excited to have this conversation, um, thinking about the past 30 years of pandemics and epidemics in Southern Africa. We have an exciting panel, um, including academics, students, um, activists, musicians, artists. And so we're hoping for a really productive um, conversation in the next hour and a half or so. Um, so without wasting any more time, um, I will not introduce the panelists. I'll allow them an opportunity to introduce themselves. Um, my main role is only to, to chair um, the session. So when we're discussing the format and how we wanted the, the, the webinar to feel, we all agreed that we also want to bring in the participants, sorry, the attendees as, as much as possible into the conversation. So you don't have to wait till the end um, of, the, of, of the speakers to raise your hand or questions. Um, anytime someone finishes speaking, if you have an intervention or you want to make a contribution, please do raise your hand and I will um, we'll, we'll come to you. So we want this to really feel like a conversation rather than um, a traditional lecture. So up first will be Professor Jonathan Stedler. Um, Prof Stedler, if you can um, introduce yourself first for people who don't know you. And Prof Stedler is going to set the context for the past 30 years of pandemics and epidemics um, in Southern Africa. And then we'll continue from, from there onwards. Over to you, Prof. Well, thank you so much. Uh... Kobani and and welcome everybody to this seminar. Um, 30 years of pandemics. Originally, when I was approached by folk at UJ, um, they were we were being encouraged to talk about 30 years of democracy and the sort of challenges and transformations that have taken place in South Africa. Um, and we decided to do this through the lenses of uh, this relatively new democracy in facing health crises. Uh, and that is why it's 30 years of pandemics. It's not really 30 years of pandemics, though. It's, it's probably more like 120 years of pandemics. But nonetheless, it was a handy uh, placeholder to frame this discussion. So I just have already a few might seem like random comments to make about uh, this issue, about the 30 years of pandemics and about the special issue that we are celebrating today at the ASNA issue. Um, I think I'm going to be quite quick as time is short, but uh, hopefully provoke a little bit of discussion. So when I was thinking about this, I thought, well, we should sort of really take quite seriously um, the historical lens to think about how the South African state responded to COVID. And I've, I've always felt that one of the most striking aspects of the COVID epidemic is the continuities it exhibits with earlier epidemics in South African history. So, you know, the logic of the lockdowns and the use of often violent means to enforce these resonated quite strongly with the ways in which the state responded initially to epidemics such as a bubonic plague in the early 1900s, as well as the Spanish flu um, and other epidemics. So during these epidemics, the colonial authorities imposed quarantine and forced removals, ostensibly to curtail the spread of disease. In Johannesburg, where pneumonic plague was spreading mainly amongst black and Indian households in the area known as Newtown, which is just down the road from where I am, um, thousands of residents were relocated into camps southwest of the city. A cordon was drawn around Johannesburg and these neighborhoods were eviscerated by fire. They were burnt to the ground, ostensibly to remove plague from the earth that these houses occupied. The camps later became the first formal settlements to, known today as Soweto. Many historians agree that the plague provided the legitimation that the authorities required to enforce segregation in the name of protecting white interests and health and white health. 
The epidemic expediency of the sanitization and eradication of plague achieved political objectives beyond those of a public health intent. So if you think about the COVID uh, pandemic, during COVID, the lockdowns um, introduced to us sort of a radical biopolitics, which led to the suspension of movement, economic activity, and in many cases, suspension of human rights. This impacted poorer communities and by far black South Africans. Um, Stephen X, uh, anthropologist, argues that a radical biopolitics is when health becomes the supreme value and capital becomes subservient to it. So to a great extent, the implications of adopting this form of biopolitics meant that poorer, marginalized and peripheral communities experienced worsening conditions. And for many, this imposed a greater threat to life than the disease itself. Moreover, the enforcement of lockdowns impacted significantly on our abilities to care, on the economies of care. Yeah, so our collective capacity was uh, to care for others was threatened. Apart from, you know, banging on, um, making a noise, banging on saucepans at night at a particular time, there were great limitations that were placed upon us. So for healthcare workers, for family members and for communities. And although these restrictions on our capacity to care for the sick, dying and dead, followed biomedical logics of infection control, this has had significant implications for the rights of people to practice customary care or customs of care. For instance, the suspension of customary funerary rights um, and several authors in the special edition have described in detail the sorts of impact that that has had. So we can also speculate on the deeper implications and meanings that are conveyed through the suspension of customs of care and ask questions about how public health measures are used to curtail and constrain the practice of custom. In previous epidemics, notably HIV, but also others, Ebola, for instance, customary practices and beliefs were frequently targeted as causing greater epidemic spread and even uh, viral origins. Public health research identified sexual and healing practices as the reason for the rapid and uncontrolled spread of HIV in African countries. In most cases, these sort of allegations proved to be simply false and thinly veiled racial casting. Um, and sort of my sort of final point perhaps is that I want to sort of reflect on the sorts of challenges that doing research on COVID placed on us as anthropologists, historians, etc. Or indeed anyone wanting really to get beyond the statistical rendering of the pandemic. The narrative of COVID was to a large extent controlled through the state mandated research of the National Institute of Communicable Diseases. This body produced daily data on the incidence of COVID cases, morbidity and mortality. The rapidity of the flow of data was unprecedented in South Africa's um, history and indeed in global history. Never before have we received so much information so rapidly um, in such a format um, to the public. The daily updates that we received through the media reflected a real-time imaginary of epidemic spread. Unlike in previous epidemics that relied on uh, annual surveys of incidents and cases, for example, with like HIV, we received these like incredibly um, detailed daily media updates. So as this data flowed, so the state responded in turn, tuning the epidemic response from one stage of lockdown to the next, either increasing it or lowering it. <laughs> and urging the public to, you know, sort of take responsibility to protect themselves, wear masks, sanitize, stay away from others. This sort of materialized the epidemic from an imagined virus into numbers that could be comprehended. Yet at the same time that the COVID epidemic was being sort of revealed in this very open public manner, through this data, sort of barrage of data, if you like, there was also much that was being concealed. And 
I want to sort of say that the lockdowns did not only restrict our movements and ability to be <clears throat> among people, but this also threatened the production of knowledge and the free flow of knowledge. For example, these very harsh penalties that were imposed on individuals who use social media to spread so-called misinformation was for me the thin end of the wedge in attempts to exert control over the free flow of knowledge. People's reflections and speculations about the epidemic were very much pushed down. And it really threatened the capacity of the public to reflect on COVID through local cultural and social framings, to interpret the data in terms of individual and collective experiences, and potentially uh, impose restrictions on our academic freedoms to express ourselves, as well as those of the public. So that's why I think that this is a really special, special issue. Um, the collection of articles reveals a variety of approaches that were adopted by individual researchers. I mean, that's all of you. From the very deeply and intimately engaged ethnographic research to those based on viewing from a much broader perspective, um, using media reports, uh, it really demonstrates for me the productivity and creativity of the anthropological research that was done, even at this time of really harsh restrictions. And so, yeah, just to say again, this is what makes this special issue especially special. Um, so I think I'll end here. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Um, thank you so much, um, Prof. So for I see people are still um, coming into the room. So if you missed um, the early parts, um, we really want this to feel like a conversation. So please don't wait till all the speakers have gone, even if you are in the audience. Um, so please feel free um, as we proceed um, to ask questions, to um, provide interventions, reflections and so on. So thank you so much, um, Professor Stedler. I think you gave us so much there in terms of providing the, the historical context, um, as well as highlighting some of the key differences, for instance, with COVID-19 versus other epidemics that we've had. Um, just to ask you a question before we move on <clears throat> to the next speaker. Um, so Kekana, please prepare yourself. You're going to be next. Um, as a researcher also, I mean, um, of um, H the HIV AIDS um, pandemic, which is now, of course, endemic in many Southern African contexts, um, you've already told us um, a little bit about, for instance, um, some of the major differences. So the number, the level of data that institutions like the NICD were able to collect with um, COVID that they might not have, for instance, with HIV AIDS. So I just wanted to ask you a two part question. Part one is, I think what was, I think what for me would be the question of what was really striking for you um, with COVID-19, maybe that was similar or maybe that was different to um, other pandemics, particularly HIV AIDS um, in your in your research. Um, and yeah, let, let me ask only that one question for now. Um, I think what is striking for you and what was um, what was similar or what was um, different or striking for you with um, the ways in which we experienced the COVID-19 pandemic. And then Gagana, just prepare yourself, you, you're you going to be next. Yeah, I mean, that's a great question, actually, and sort of been trying to grapple with that, perhaps. But um, yeah, as a, as a researcher in the midst of the sort of huge wave of um, the epidemic in the early 90s and early 2000s, what was most striking was how you know, the context was you know, initially one of denying the existence of HIV as a causal factor for AIDS. And we've we've been through the, the you know, sort of thinking about that quite a lot. Um, but what was really, I think one of the biggest differences is how South African civil society formed uh, very rapidly and very early on a response of their own um, in the absence of sort of strong state support. Um, the, the government initially didn't really respond actively to the, the, the um, HIV AIDS epidemic and Nelson Mandela's government didn't. Um, and the difference with, with COVID, I think, is that we just didn't have that kind of sense of civil society kind of coming to the fore 
it was almost as if that was really suppressed because we kind of couldn't meet with each other. We couldn't gather together. Um, there is a sense that during COVID, people felt very optimistic about sort of how the COVID time, the restrictions that were placed on us, nonetheless, the COVID time provided a sort of a sense of, uh, you know, the sort of Victor Turner's communitas, the sense of like all of us going through this thing together in the same way and we're all affected and we're all banding together. But really, were we all go experiencing COVID in the same way? Um, I don't think so. I think that, you know, the, the harsh realities are is that poorer communities with less access to you know, Wi-Fi, to shopping online and to other kinds of resources just to survive meant that that w was a bit of an illusion. And I, I, I said this in a seminar a couple of years ago or something. I got shot down for saying that. But uh, <laughs> nonetheless, it's sort of that that sense of communitas and going through this whole thing together. It hasn't really had any long lasting effects, has it? Oh, well, maybe it has. Maybe people can prove me wrong. But yeah, I don't think it was like AIDS in that sense that we had this very strong civil movement, which has evolved into, you know, sort of political formations. Anyway, thanks very much for your question. I hope that kind of answers it. <laughs> no, it does. It does. Thank you so much, Prof. Deadline. I think all comments already coming in for you in the in the comment section. Sandy Lengit is saying great inputs by Prof. Stedler. The data flood was phenomenal, a tad overwhelming and deafening, and sometimes no um, dialogue was allowed. So I think um, people are, um, are, are appreciating the contribution. Thank you so much. Up next is um, Lishono Lokekana. Lishono, if you can um, introduce yourself first and then um, starts with your interventions. I want to say before um, Lishono goes, um, Lishono was essentially, um, although I ended up getting the final credit, but he was supervised by Professor Stedler and I, and he actually does um, <clears throat> groundbreaking research um, studying up institutions um, 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 such as the NICD. And um, thank you to Prof Stedler, of course, for pioneering and planting that um, that seed in, in Gekana to pursue that research. Um, also worth saying that um, his article in our special issue is the most downloaded and is already prescribed at um, the University of Pretoria School of Public Health. So that's an, an amazing feat for a, a young emerging scholar. So um, we are excited to have you here. Um, Gekana, over to you. Um, yeah, hi everyone. Um, thank you for, the, for that warm introduction. And uh, also, I just want to take the opportunity to thank you, both Prof. Stadler and Kawani, for the kind of impact you've had on my uh, on my research. Uh, it's been very valuable. And I'd also like to take the opportunity as well to give thanks to the journal and the editors, you know, for allowing us to be part of this um, special issue, you know, give us, giving us the opportunity to reflect uh, more deeply, right, about the pandemics that once interrupted our lives and kind of challenged how we made sense of our social interactions in various kinds of ways. So I just want to say I also kind of thoroughly enjoyed reading every each and every contribution and the special issue and congratulations to everyone who contributed. Um, I guess I'm also going to take this opportunity to reflect about my own contribution and the special issue uh, and to kind of shed some light into my thinking around it. So the, 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 the research that was presented in this um, contribution in the special issue was part of my master's research, which focused on vaccine hesitancy, um, particularly how this knowledge on vaccine hesitancy um, that is derived from various kinds of research is operationalized by public health professionals and public health agencies alike um, in trying to improve vaccination uptake. Um, the bulk of this research um, I wrote during the, the, the COVID-19 pandemic, um, I remember we were still under lockdown regulations and writing during this period kind of giving the opportunity to observe more closely um, public health approaches to, to, to in addressing vaccine hesitancy. Um, it also gave me an opportunity as well to kind of observe how scholars were researching and writing. Um, about vaccine hesitancy, as well as to kind of 
also observe the various responses from the general public. And what I realized from these observations is that there was a certain degree of similarities in terms of how, you know, vaccine hesitancy was approached um, um, when, when, when compared to how it was approached historically in other contexts, right? So, for example, if you start with the responses from the general public, um, the various reasons and motivations behind why certain people were skeptical um, in using the, the COVID-19 vaccines was quite similar, you know, to the responses that are recorded in, in the scholarship on vaccine hesitancy, right, concerning other uh, pandemics or epidemics, right? So there was really not much change in terms of how people feel about vaccines in general, right? Although um, access to vaccines might have been a, a component that was unique um, to this COVID-19 uh, context um, as a result of this so-called um, vaccine nationalism or vaccine um, apartheid. Um, on the other hand, when you look at the public health approach as well, um, it was also quite similar, right, um, to, to, to how vaccine hesitancy was approached historically as well, especially with the introduction of mandatory um, vaccination programs, right, which have always almost have had a negative impact to how people make sense of their bodily um, autonomy, right, which is something that is um, well documented in scholarship. Um, again, when you look at the kind of research um, and the findings uh, from this from this kind of research, um, you begin to realize that it kind of reproduced the same kind of information, right, to that that is already um, documented. Um, the bulk of this research um, focused on the responses of the general public, right? So as a result, it kind of produced nothing new outside of what is already um, being documented. And I, I guess that the reason behind this is because of this um, persistent process of studying down vaccine hesitancy by only just focusing on the general public's responses, right? And all of this, to me, kind of resonated heavily with, um, you know, Chimamanda's concept of the single story, right, which she describes as a narrative that presents only one perspective, repeated again and again, right? And this is how I really felt about all this knowledge on vaccine hesitancy that was produced, right? It was, it did not produce any new perspective, especially when it comes to our understanding of vaccines. And... With all of that, kind of back the question of if you already know what really causes, you know, vaccine hesitancy to a certain extent, what are we really doing with all this information that has been gathered from years and years of, 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 of research, right? How is this knowledge utilized, right? How is it operationalized in the context of public health agencies, right? Um, does the manner in which this knowledge is operationalized produce better results in terms of um, improving vaccination coverage, right? And um, by the time I was writing this, this, this paper, there were no studies that really focused on the operationalization of this knowledge, right? Um, available studies merely provided suggestions and recommendations on how to go about that. And these suggestions and recommendations were merely, were, were, they were premised on the idea that um, vaccine hesitancy is fundamentally a product of misinformation and epistemological differences. Um, that the manner in which certain populations um, interact, um, consume and understand scientific knowledge behind vaccines does not quite align with how um, public health agencies intended it to be, right? And as a result of that, and as a result of my findings, is that the knowledge on vaccine is therefore oper operationalized in a sense, in a way that tries to, to, to kind of educate people uh, about the science behind vaccines, um, something that has not necessarily been successful, um, because, you know, um, if, if, if people have never received the same kind of training that public health professionals have received, 
um, how do you then expect them to grasp that knowledge with the same kind of, 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 of ease, right? So there is this inherent belief that um, uh, that the, the, the perspectives of, 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 of public health professionals should be treated as the gospel, right? And while that might be necessary for the greater health of the public, um, in contexts where there's already a waning trust in government institutions, it becomes difficult for the public um, to take everything at face at face value, right? Because they're also are motivated by legitimate concerns, right? Such as experiencing um, adverse vaccine side effects, which may be a product of um, malpractice or negligence, right? And these are concerns that in most cases, public, public health professionals often choose to address privately because they also have their own legitimate concerns because they don't want to create even more scares, right? And kind of diminish the already waning trust um, in vaccines, right? Um, if we were told that there is a 1% chance that someone would um, experience vaccine side effects, adverse vaccine side effects, feel like no one would have would be comfortable in taking the vaccine so it's, it's it's a question of how can public professionals really reconcile their own concerns with that of the public to create uh more comprehensive solutions and i think i'll just um end it there thank you Fantastic. Um, thank you so much, um, Kekana. So I'm going to ask, because your contribution actually ties very well into um, Talent Moyos, because you are both in many ways concerned with um, the role of the state um, in, 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 in public health in, in information. So I'm going to ask you one question whilst um, Talent, if you can get your, yourself ready um, for, for next. But mine would be, I think you sort of touched on it um, towards the end, but I, I would also ask similar to, to Prof Stedler. Um, what researching, because it is true, um, even with COVID, we did see that um, a lot of the focus on vaccine hesitancy was on individuals rather than also um, amongst the, the state people. So if the NICD said something, it was almost, you are, you are, you know, buying into conspiracy theories if you have any kind of critique of that knowledge. So I think for me, it would be, I think what surprised you the most um, as someone who actually started this project with Prof Stedler long before COVID started about um, vaccine hesitancy amongst public health or people got, um, tasked to safeguard the the health of the of the public and then um after your question if there isn't any from the floor we'll go to to talent okay cool um really just observing public health professionals and you know having conversations with them uh i kind of realized that you know they also have their own kind of concerns with with with, with vaccines um from a personal perspective Right. But because they've received all this training in public health, um, they are able to kind of bypass their own personal um, concerns and actually put their trust on vaccines because they understand that they understand the, 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 the science behind um, um, the vaccine. Right. And I remember I was speaking to one of the, the public health professionals there. Uh, I think it was a vaccine, one of the early childhood vaccines. And she told me how scared she was uh, in exposing a child to that to that vaccine because she 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 wants to a child who experienced uh, adverse vaccine side effects to that but because um she understand that there's a slight chance of that happening to her child and because she understand how this um science operates she 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 was able to kind of put that aside and just continue to give a child um the vaccine so i guess Whatever concerns that the public have uh, are quite similar to how public health professionals have those concerns as well, because they are also human at the end of the day. Um, but in their um, in their programs, uh, they seem not to kind of take that into consideration, right? Because these are actually legitimate concerns that people have, but they are not being addressed, uh, I think, more effectively. Fantastic. Um, thank you so much, Kekana. Um, Talent, are you there? 
Okay, oh. Uh, uh, I think Prof has a question. Oh, sorry, uh, Prof Stedler, sorry, I missed it. Uh, please go. Yeah, hi, um, that was really, really interesting. I'm so glad this work has kind of continued to be so relevant to understanding not just what, you know, the time that you wrote, writing and researching, but to our questions about vaccine hesitancy today. And it's, yeah, um, something quite wonderful. Um, I think this issue about public health professionals and their sort of attitudes towards vaccinations is really, really interesting. And, um, you know, with apologies to the student who I'm about to cite, I won't tell you who it is, but it's an honor student in um, anthropology this year. Her project was to look at nurses and to their sort of vaccine hesitancy. And a lot of the nurses who she interviewed, in fact, the majority, were vaccine hesitant and were very, very concerned about taking the vaccine. And although they sort of, you know, kind of came up with the usual sort of narratives about, well, we're worried about the side effects because we know as professionals, your health professionals, they can be side effects and et cetera, et cetera. One of the things that she came up with is that it had a lot to do with their status in society and the way in which their status as nurses, as professionals, as um, health professionals, as knowledgeable people, sort of set themselves apart from the rest of the community um, in, a, in a way, um, suggesting that they were unlike ordinary people and didn't need the vaccine, therefore, because they were not going to put themselves at risk of uh, acquiring a, um, a COVID. So it was a sort of a way in which they sort of, yeah, attempted to kind of, sort of exhibit and reinforce their status. Um, and it kind of reminds me of the way in which uh, in the US we have, you know, vaccine hesitancy amongst certain sectors of the population. Um, and a lot of these um, are parents who refuse to allow their children to get vaccinated. <clears throat> because they come from um, a particular social class um, and they are members of, I can't remember the name of the school, but um, an elite schooling program. Well, the, um, the Waldorf, thank you, yes. <laughs> you, I think you read that article. Um, and it sort of makes me think that a lot of this has actually got maybe not so much to do with the medical, biomedical knowledge and you know, sort of uh, aspects of it, but actually the social, cultural kind of sort of um, identities that being vaccinated, not vaccinating kind of form. So super interesting. Thank you so much. <clears throat> yeah. Thanks, uh, before we, we go to, to your response, um, Gekana, to Prof Stedler, there's another question from you. Um, from Dungane S. Mr. Dungane um, at Stellenbosch, who's asking, um, why do we treat public health officials as impartial or immune from their social conditions? Doesn't this anthropologically cause some concerns when their work comes into public scrutiny, as if they are separate uh, from the lived realities of those scientific truths? So, if you can just um, quickly respond both to the to the question in the chat as well as to to Prof. Stedler's um, intervention, then um, talent will go to you. If talent is not ready, um, Prof. Powers um, will will come to you. Okay, thank you. I think I'll start with the one in the chat. Um, it's, it's a really, really good question and, and an interesting one at that. Um, and I think, I don't know, part of the reason is that um, people who work in public health ag health agencies or in, 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 in institutions of power, um, they are often overlooked, you know, and even with research, you know what I mean? And that, that was part of my main argument in doing this research is that we never really um, shed light or draw attention to, the, to, 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 to how actually public health professionals feel about these things, right? And they're merely just treated as, as, as people who are in a position of authority and whatever they're saying should be treated as the gospel, right? And underneath all of that, or underneath the, the professional um statuses they act there is actually concerns that they have as well right they are actually humans who have um 
concerns about these things, but because of their job, um, they're kind of not allowed to, 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 to be talking about these things because sometimes they're even scared um, of losing their jobs, right? And I remember interviewing the public health professionals there and about telling me about the story with their children. Uh, one of the first things she said is that, please don't write my name about this. What I'm about to say should just remain between the two of us here. But I actually don't trust these vaccines, right? We have seen a lot of um, accidents that have been happening here. And being at the forefront of that, seeing those things in, in person, it really scares me a lot. And I, I've, I'm scared for my children for taking these vaccines. But I can't talk about these things because this is my job. You know, so I have to lead by example since I'm at the forefront of these things. So, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's a really important question that you're asking there. Thank you. I, I think that also kind of ties to what Prof Stedler said as well, right, that they also have their own social statuses that they're trying to um, protect as well. So, yeah, I think I'll just leave it there. Fantastic. Um, thank you so much. Um, 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 Gagana. Um, talent, are you able to um, come on? Like, good, good day, everyone. Uh, good day, everyone. I, uh, good, I, I, Prof. Tovela, uh, I, <laughs> uh, Prof. Stedler, and everyone else. Uh, thank you for having me uh, from uh, Michigan State University in Zimbabwe. And uh, I would like to thank uh, the uh, Journal of Southern Africa, uh, uh, Southern uh, Africa Anthropology, for organizing this uh, special issue. So, well, uh, as a, I'll, I'll start on, on a personal note. Uh, as a sociologist, in the, uh, I, I, double, I double majored in sociology and social anthropology. So, when the, uh, the, uh, the pandemic, uh, uh, erupted, uh, so it, it became personal to me in a way because uh, where I work is another province, and where I come from is another province. So uh, from time to time, I need, needed to connect with my with my people and so forth, and uh, that was very interesting because uh, I, I discovered that uh, is myself uh, my positionality as a uh, probably as someone who is located elsewhere, like maybe within the university sector. I had the pass to 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 to, to commute between these two provinces to to, to commute maybe from Meklens to 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 to, to Blawa, like or on a, maybe only a weekly on a weekly basis. But what I witnessed uh, within that period was that anyone else who did not have that kind of a privilege to say we have the pass because I had been given the pass by the by, by, by the university, everyone was given because we are now termed as the. Uh, those ones who can move around and support the essential services, uh, essential services and so forth. But now the ordinary people, that was where the problem was. And uh, every day, you know, when you commute, you you see roadblocks, you know. We now, the, the, there was this uh, evoking of the, what, 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 what uh, other scholars have been in terming it, the repressive state apparatus and so forth. Uh, you see these roadblocks, you pass, you through, you go through passes and so forth, and people are giving their narratives and saying that some of us, we cannot really travel from one place to another and so forth. And even it, it, it went further on to, 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 to people even within the city on itself, commuting to work and so forth. And such a, I saw that um, uh, unfolding and it evoked to me to say, ah, this is what, uh, Foucault was talking about when he was talking about biopower subjects, governmentality, and so forth. So it, it was very uh, uh, not interesting as such because it was uh, it, it was painful to see, especially for other people, because of various stories. You hear that someone, I, I miss my family. I cannot travel because I am deemed as a as someone who is not part of the essential services. And so uh, the, the soon I started to. Uh, uh, to think about this idea in terms of writing a paper and so forth. And now the the, the, the challenge that I was now facing, no one is, is willing to talk to you and uh, you are even afraid to say, to talk to someone, to, to the next person next to you. So uh, the, the so I, and then the interesting thing was that uh, the, the, the social media 
became uh, the, the field, you know, uh, that field that way I saw a lot, especially concerning the, 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 the pandemic and so forth. And that's when I started to, 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 to write about this uh, vaccination drive and so forth, and how it affected the agency of individuals and how even the state uh, was responding. Because on a daily basis, people were updating and so forth and uh, telling out their stories, the narratives, you know. So uh, that's when I started to develop this uh, concept based on that. And then I had to go back to, to, to issues to say, so how can I write? How can I talk to these people? So basically, uh, my main uh, sources were Facebook and, um, and Twitter through the, the, the hashtags. So especially the, the, the live uh, threads and so forth and the app, the use of uh, the use of the app and the live streaming and so forth. So it was very interesting because people will come and say their stories. And uh, what was really prominent uh, uh, within that context was that people, it seems like those ones, they, there was the us and them, those who were willing to, to vaccinate uh, their agency uh, was enabled. While it's those ones on the other hand was who had uh, some form of uh, disbelief in terms of not even trusting like what uh, the previous speaker was talking about in terms of vaccine hesitance and any other reason. So th these are people whose agency was completely disabled in a way because they were not even allowed. So to others, it, it ended up making them being compelled to, 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 to vaccinate against their will. Because even at workplace on a daily basis, you'll be asked to say, do, do you have a, a pass? Do you, do you have that vaccine card? Now we're back to, to the situation is now reminiscent of the, the colonial era whereby pass, you know, the pass was the, the, the most important aspect of your life for you to, to be mobile. So that was very interesting in a way because it evoked all those things and seeing again the, the heavy presence of the uh, repressive state apparatus such as the army and so forth. It's not something that uh, you would wish to see on a daily basis. And there were some even some pictures circulating on the social media where people, uh, if I can term it in a way, maybe harassed and so forth, uh, where they were, when they were enforcing. So it was really uh, uh, interesting to, to, to go and look at those questions to say, now people started talking about if you do not have the, 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 the vaccine, uh, uh, the, the vaccine card, you are uh, totally, you know, your agency has been restricted. And the other things uh, that I discovered was that uh, a, within the people who were there in the public spaces, there was this move away from maybe, let's talk about uh, these institutions. We see the institutions monitoring people's behaviors and so forth. Now people were even monitoring people's behaviors. Now you need to, to, to act in a certain way to say social distancing and so forth. And even yourself in how you engage, how you engage with others. So we, we saw some form of um, the change in terms of even the concept of governmentality, where we see it going a uh, uh, reverse way, where you are saying now the ordinary people within societies are the ones who are now uh, enforcing in terms of uh, every regulations and so forth because of because of the need to self-preserve. So in the, in the aspect of self-preserving, people had this, uh, they ended up self-disciplining in a way that you need to, 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 to either go around from this place, I'm not supposed to do A, B, C, D, and so forth. So that was the, the, the main um, uh, discovery, what, what I saw, what, what is it happened. So I had the privilege again to, to, to be mobile. So that privilege again, in terms of uh, my positionality, it afforded me uh, to see, especially to have a different perspective in terms of what was happening on the ground. Because others, you know, uh, to even go to an extent of saying, I need a, a book from a doctor, you know, you know, that book that you have when you attend to, maybe when you go for health, if you are seeking in terms of medical help and so forth, that was the one that people are now using, even in terms of where you are shopping. You cannot show to maybe uh, uh, in terms of the distance, the parameters in terms of where you, or which one is a shopping center and so forth and so forth. So that was the thing. And the public transport again, in terms of how it was managed, 
Yes, Zimbabwe, we, we saw the banning, the ultimate ban on, uh, on, 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 on taxes, you know, these uh, commuter omnibus that are owned by people. And then they were compelled to join the state uh, sanctioned group uh, under the Zimbabwe United Bus uh, Passenger Company, whereby if it's either for your livelihood, or you have to compel, you have to be under this group to operate. But the funny thing is that mostly it was uh, the use of buses. In the buses, there was a lot of crowding. There was no social distancing. But the fact that it was uh, sanctioned by the government, it was deemed uh, is appropriate. While the, 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 the combis, they were shut, totally shut. So for people with, who do, did not own cars, it was a very, uh, it was a problem to them. So that was a, one of those uh, major findings I discovered. Uh, thank you. Wonderful. Um, thank you, Talent. And so good to, I think this, although we've spoken, this is the first time I'm seeing you properly. So um, thank you so much for, for, your, for your wonderful intervention. Um, we're going to go to Prof Powers, but um, whilst he prepares himself, I think for me, um, I really, really enjoyed actually reading um, your paper. And I, I really think it's worth for anyone if um, 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 to, to really download and to read it. And I think it's going to be cited um, for a very long time in studies of health and government uh, governmentality. And I really, I think I, it was so striking to me um, the ways in which you were able to show the ways in which now, you know, it's no longer the Foucault mo model of the state in many ways policing the body, how in some ways now the individual becomes the enforcer of, 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 of governmentality and so on. So my question um, was Prof Powers or um, uh, other people prepare theirs is really tied to the question of social media. I mean, I, did, I don't think there's been a pandemic or even an epidemic in, in, in history where social media was also such a huge part. So even with Kekana's work on the NICD, the major communication channel that they would use to share these deaths and information was on Twitter or on Facebook and so on. So I guess my question is, how do you see this evolving in our future? I mean, pandemics are, we are almost guaranteed a, a, a pandemic every 70, 80 years. So we are bound in this lifetime again to likely experience another one if we live long enough. And I guess my question for you is, how do you see um, social media, which now has become the battleground for ideas around health and the body and so on. How do you see it playing a role um, in our future for health um, governance? I hope I'm making sense. Okay, okay. Thank you for that. Thank you for your comment. So I, I think basically uh, the, the advent of social media, it gives and maybe it gives us an advantage uh, in terms of uh, uh, pandemics in a way that now we can even communicate and we see the magnitude. And even in terms of, well, let's go back to, 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 to the issue of self-disciplining that, uh, that we saw. You can even see, now you have these graphic pictures, especially uh, previously in, in the past months, two months, we've seen the, the graphic pictures of inboxing, the, the, the image, what they, the, they evolved within people. So people now understand the extent of the of the pandemic through graphical ways without hearing about something, you know, hearing about something to say that there's something called impox. But those pictures were so, were so graphic that, that were being posted online and so forth. And it makes you to, to self-discipline in terms of how you behave at the end of the day. <laughs> you will be afraid seeing rather than hearing about something. And uh, when you see something, it's easy to to, 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 to believe in terms of even self-disciplining because we have seen it. Uh, you don't want to be an example and you don't want to be caught in that kind of scenario. And again, now, you know, this viral, going viral, uh, you are afraid to say, uh, well, what if my, 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 I'm, I'm posted someone, post me being uh, beaten up by maybe soldiers and so forth, and I, I become a meme. And something like that. Now you are trying to to to, to run away from that. So that there's this self surve uh, surveillance that uh, we will try to to make sure to, to avoid that gas that camera because everyone is now uh, with this citizen journalism through social media. You are even afraid to say what what if people see me being beaten up 
uh, this, this the internet won't erase this and so, and, and so forth. So now you have to, to self discipline. So I think it's it's, it's, it's an advantage. Uh, I think it's, it's a game changer in terms of pandemics and future pandemics and maybe in terms of surveillance in future and everything else and real time data collection and so forth. I think it will be a game changer, a, a big game changer. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, um, Talent. I see there's a question for you um, in the in the chat, so I'll just read it out for you. It says, uh, with the introduction of mandatory vaccination, having proof that you are vaccinated in order to gain access to certain spaces often made people to complain that they have been stripped of their agency and bodily autonomy. So what happens if your agency runs the risk of putting others in danger? How do we address that? Um, that, that that's for you the tough question <laughs> yeah yeah the, the, the question is tough yeah this one is, is a bit tough but well i think uh, it's true the the, the, the part of the, that part in terms of uh, your self-harm and endangering others putting others in danger it comes into play because someone will say no i i can travel i can do whatever i want because i have this pass so maybe it's one of those downsides of those uh, in terms of um, uh, to say this uh, this past this uh, uh, this freedom that I've been given maybe that, that's the, the the downside of it because people become reckless at the end of the day due to the fact that they, they are mobile and one other thing if someone is mobile you cannot trace in terms of it's very difficult to trace let's talk about someone like myself who could travel uh, to to any province of Zimbabwe during that very particular time. It was going to be very difficult uh, to, to say, maybe I, I travel maybe Friday and then I go, I travel to anyway weekend and no one is seeing what I'm doing on weekend. And then I go back to work and then I, I just meet, I'm meeting people and so forth and doing so that was a bit, a bit reckless and it's, it's a danger again. Those, the dangers of freedom, <laughs> if I may term it like that, yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much, um, Talent. And I think um, your last comments um, lead us so nicely into Prof Power's work, particularly as he is concerned with issues of these inequalities in how we experience um, pandemics and epidemics. So I'm going to hand over to you, um, Prof Powers, um, for your own um, reflection. Wonderful. Can you all hear me? Perfect. Perfectly. Thank you. Oh, wonderful. Wonderful. Well, first, um, thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of this special issue and, and this session, uh, and the thanks to Kokwani and, and Jonathan for that. Um, and of, of course, as I, as I begin, I just want to take a moment to note that the paper is, in fact, a co-authored piece. Uh, Jimmy couldn't be with us here today, um, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll talk primarily about my own contributions to the paper and about the process that led up to me uh, I'm writing the paper. Um, Arundhati Roy's work, I think, has inspired many of us. Um, this South, this, a South Asian literary scholar and kind of theorist of, of worlds otherwise. Uh, and, and Roy's work uh, kind of took a turn towards thinking about public health during the early days of the pandemic. And in 2020, she wrote a piece, a short piece aimed at a public audience uh, that framed the, the pandemic as a portal, as something that carried the possibility of, of, of carrying us into a new world. Uh, this is a really optimistic vision to, to think about how we could leave behind the failures of the present of the neoliberal world uh, and begin to live a world and a future otherwise. Uh, I think echoing the sentiments of a lot of uh, scholars who are engaged in decolonial praxis around the world today. So some of my early work on the pandemic kind of was inspired by Roy's framing of the pandemic as a portal and uh, framing what Jonathan had spoken about earlier to think about the kind of rather kind of severe and authoritarian response that the South African state had towards particularly uh, historically marginalized communities of color in South Africa, particularly folks living in, you know, black South Africans living in the townships. You know, there were kind of uh, severe instances of, of, of state violence towards people that was oftentimes uh, or several, several occasions lethal. Um, this form of kind of authoritarian public health response and the lethality of it uh, was nevertheless lionized in Western media. 
outlets such as The Economist and The Financial Times looked at South Africa as an exemplar of pandemic response. I mean, this, of course, the coloniality of these responses and the kind of, uh, kind of clear indifference to death, particularly of, of Black South Africans that was inherent in this response from the global north or the west or the former imperial metropoles, however one wants to frame uh, the kind of source from which these discourses were emanating about the South African response, led me to think about historical correspondences in the colonial era, particularly since this was coming, these were coming from British publications, and about the responses to bubonic plague uh, in the earlier phase in Cape Town and in Johannesburg, um, around the kind of the early phase of the early 20th century. Um, and one of the, the kind of key points that I, I pulled out of thinking about these two pandemic responses in conversation with one another was that the post-apartheid South African state has added biopolitical capacities relative to the Black South African majority, um, be it via social grants programs, which I think we can all agree are, are not relatively sparse and insufficient to meet the level of need, but nevertheless, a biopolitical kind of form of care has been extended as part of the post-apartheid social contract even if it is unfolding within a kind of neoliberal austere environment whereby these um, provisions are, are insufficient. Nevertheless, certain necropolitical state capacities have continued on from the past into the present, uh, enforcing COVID restrictions by any means necessary, uh, including lethal force, highlighted how some of the state capacities from the past in the kind of logics of these modalities nevertheless continue on with us into the present moment. Um, and, um, you know, this, I published this work in open anthropological research, uh, as, you know, no paywall is important to me in terms of engaging conversations with scholars across the global north and the global south, just as we're doing today. And this work with Roy in, in the portal kind of led me kind of to kind of think with Jimmy about the ways in which kind of expanding the analytical lens beyond kind of the national case study, this containerized Cartesian notion of space where pandemics and pathogens are moving beyond and across them. And our analytical lenses don't, they fail to take into account the way that both pathogens and ideas are circumventing the kind of containment strategies of the state, the ways in which states in their kind of capacities for numeracy um, relative to pandemics and other biopolitical criteria, right? have a see and think in particular ways that may not necessarily reflect how information and pathogens are circulating in the world itself. And, you know, that led us to think, Jimmy and I, to think about kind of transnational spaces, about the kind of the internet and online resources and, and social media as repositories for ideas that may be serving as common platforms for forms of heterodox interpretations of pandemics, pathogens, in ways to kind of respond to them. Um, you know, I, in terms of, of, of thinking about states, you know, I, in thinking about the US and South Africa together, I think we were, we were quite uh, attuned to the fact that we're making uh, not a comparison, but thinking about kind of connection and disconnection in, in, in ideas and pathogens moving. Um, but, but even thinking about countries such as the US and South Africa, in tandem, I think, uh, was intentionally trying to kind of challenge notions of coloniality of the global north, the global south, developed, developing, upper income, middle income, whatever classifications we seek to kind of utilize to kind of think about these containerized notions of space, they engage with notions of coloniality and they kind of invoke hierarchies where I think uh, we need to think carefully about hierarchy and power always, uh, but not necessarily assume those in the kind of ways in which we engage uh, should be attuned to that. And in particular, I was uh, focused on including a particular section of the case study in the United States and Iowa about the state and about state capacity, about contract tendering and irregularities in the state in the U.S., about uh, the ways in which uh, the misspending of funds in the U.S. was occurring via the state. Because discourses about the state, discourses about misallocation of funds are things that we associate not with the global north but with the Global South, and they're occurring in the Global North continuously and need to be challenged, need to be thought of. And we don't talk about neo-patrimonial regimes in the Global North. We don't talk about corruption as much as we should. And I think that 
uh, kind of framing uh, these uh, kind of dynamics in ways that challenge these kind of uh, Afro-pessimistic notions of the state, of governance, uh, of personhood, uh, are critical steps that, that we can undertake in, in the work that we do uh, to, to work against that uh, kind of bias that many of us uh, see in the work and the popular media and even in academic accounts uh, of African people and societies that need to be countered at every turn. But to return to the paper and the kind of transnational repository of ideas, I think one of the ways in which we framed this was how people, actors, are able to engage in, in the, the work of translation and assemblage or to access these ideas, to kind of assemble them in ways uh, that kind of are, uh, let's say, reflect their perspectives, their kind of epistemological positioning relative to a pathogen, an epidemic, their society, a new governmental regime, or relatively new in the case of South Africa, uh, that challenges can, historical notions of race and hierarchy uh, in ways that populations may seek to reject or, or not accept. Um, in, in the context of Iowa, it was, of course, something different and, and one where I sought to kind of think from where I was. Um, and, and I'll return to South Africa momentarily. But the kind of counter epistemic turn, right, in, in the context of Iowa had me thinking a lot about um, the ways in which uh, kind of discourses of abstract liberal norms around freedom, liberty, tyranny, were actively reproducing harm, were actively exposing at risk populations to the threat of death. But that threat of death, that kind of connection between kind of these abstract norms, the kind of uh, one of the kind of key repositories for responses, I think, in both South Africa and in the U.S. That, that Jimmy and I were kind of seeking to think through, again, not in a comparative way, uh, but in a way where we're trying to understand the movement of ideas and how people on the ground are exerting agency by assembling these into these heterodox discourses of, of the body, the health, uh, vaccines, um, kind of... Uh, policies that seek to kind of contain or, or mitigate the spread of an airborne pathogen, such as mask mandates. Um, oftentimes, the, the analysis of this process in the United States focused on state-level leadership, such as governors or you know, premiers in the South African context. Uh, but in the U.S., it would be focused on the press conference, right? on the, the political leaders, on the iconography, the positioning of people, right, as this way of thinking through power, or authority, or their voices, or their uh, policies of Democrat or Republican, or opening or closure, protection, exposure. But what I found was, in fact, that this policy had emanated not necessarily from a top-down hierarchical manner, but it emanated from a variant of heterodox kind of activism, health activism in this state, uh, whereby these two mothers who coined themselves the mama bears had sought to kind of limit mask mandates in, in, in public buildings, including uh, K through 12 education. So this kind of the scalar process to which is the MERV was through county to the state to kind of lead to kind of state mask, mand mask mandates being uh, lifted. And this policy change, I think, is critical uh, in challenging kind of the way in which we perceive power. Uh, the way in which we tend to think about health activism as something that only may occur in ways that are emerging from the progressive left. Uh, and, and, you know, my work on the South African HIV AIDS movement, I think would fit into that kind of categorization. Um, but again, our, 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 you know, the, the, looking at the emergent populist right, the idea was centralized power under Trump. And that did not necessarily hold in state level responses, which have over time coalesced into a national response which has sought to normalize the response uh, to COVID-19 in ways that are eerily reminiscent to claims that emerged from the populist right in the early days of the epidemic. Um, as a kind of general um, proxy in, in terms of the impact of these reopening policies in the state of Iowa, uh, public health researcher argued that approximately 43% of deaths in Iowa might have been avoided. Um, so, to conclude, you know, what I have been thinking about as I continue to work on these, these questions is about how liberal philosophy can kill. I mean, I've done work on austerity, and I think there's been a book called Austerity Kills, and I think that gets straight to the point of it. Cutting public health funding, funding kills, right? Kills people, and it kills unevenly. 
It kills along the lines of historical inequality along race, or class, uh, gender, sexuality, those whose bodies have been exposed to the scars of colonialized and imperialized histories of inequity over time. Um, but these abstract liberal norms serve as the basis for many modern liberal democracies, but they were birthed in the context of imperialism, of inequity, of both biopolitical dynamics for kind of settler populations and necropolitical dynamics for indigenous peoples. And I think we need to kind of continue to think about the ways in which liberal liberalism, liberal philosophy was sufficiently capacious to allow claims to freedom, liberty, and kind of escape from tyranny to exist simultaneously while exposing large and perhaps the majority of the population to political and economic and social dynamics um, that put them at far greater risk of death uh, than other populations. Uh, so I'll, I'll finish there. Um, and, and again, thanks so much for, for including me in this, this uh, wonderful conversation. Wonderful. Thank you so much, um, Professor Ted. Um, I think you gave us, <laughs> I have so many, I have literally a page of quotables um, from um, from what you've given us, not just here um, through this talk, but um, through the wonderful paper with you and, and Dr. Jimmy Peters, uh, um, I think also very, very important um, contribution, although um, of course we are located in the African continent or the quote unquote, the global south. I think that paper is a really important um, contribution that shows both, of course, the connections, um, but of course, the dissimilarities as well. So I'm going to give people a chance. Um, please type in the chat or put up your hand if you have a question for, for Prof. Ted. But mine, so long was pre people prepare themselves. Uh, Abongile, you're going to be next, so you can also prepare yourself. But is this really the question I think that um, um, you've already stated so well um, that your paper grapples with, which is really this sort of um, also ideas around um, indifference to death. And I think that I remember this New York Times article um, um, when I think the millionth death had been recorded in, in, in the US. Um, um, but also met again, again, sort of um, with what you grapple with this sort of um, um, resistance to make to 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 mass and so on. So I guess I I'm I'm, I'm asking how are, how are you thinking about, you know, why are some deaths I think um, extraordinary? I don't want to do a sort of Olympics of, you know, this death matters and this one doesn't. But it's it's quite striking that you know one million plus people can die, and there seems to be not just at a state level but at an individual level and almost an indifference. Um, to that, and then you sometimes look at um, smaller scale events that seem to to produce more emotion. Why do you think um, with COVID um, there was this sort of immunity from a lot of people, not just in the US, but we also had quite a lot of resistance as well um, in South Africa um, to, 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 to mass mandate. And then um, I, yeah, I hope I'm making sense and then you can respond and then if someone else has a question, they can put up their hand or type it in the chat. No, no, thanks very much for the question, Kukubani. I, it's an important one because I think it, it lies at the core for, or, or like kind of, a, it's an underlying philosophical and ethical consideration if we even want to begin thinking about health, public health responses, what global public health actually is and how it works. And the question of whose deaths are acceptable and why um, has, a, has a long and, and rather, um, I think, troubling history in, in the liberal era. And, and thinking, of course, back to the 18th and 19th century as a part of the emergence of liberalism, I think for me has, has forced me to face the very real fact that liberal philosophy, you know, took erasure of indigeneity of ways of being of, of those worlds as a kind of a starting point for their intellectual exercises. So the idea of a state of nature as a starting point for understanding human kind of agency in the environment outside of the West, the monarchies of the West kind of erased by default, all of the indigenous peoples of North America, of, of South America, of Central America, of the African continent, as a, as a space through which Anglo-European settlers could experience a state of nature in kind of unfettered individual, individual agency. And what would they do? What kind of 
worlds would they create? And this kind of fundamental erasure, this kind of erasure of, of the world's majority for the purposes of, of an intellectual exercise that then becomes an imperial settler apparatus that brings with it really genocidal violence, I think, to really state it clearly, for me underscores the fact that the kind of very tenets upon which we base progressive notions of social change necessarily brings with it the threat of these erasures. It can accommodate these erasures. It can accommodate indifference to death as a part of the way in which this kind of foundational philosophical kind of system works. So just as the socioeconomic right to health can be used to fight for progressive social change as it did with the HIV AIDS movement, um, and hopefully uh, through health activists kind of mobilizing to support the NHI and other initiatives that aim to support the health of the, the kind of South African majority. Um, it also simultaneously, those rights carry with them the possibility of exposure to bare life, of abandonment, and with that death. So I think it's this really double-edged sword that we have with liberal democracies and liberal philosophy, um, and, and one that I'm interested in thinking about further uh, with folks around the world, in particular with, with emerging scholars in South Africa, such as yourselves. Fantastic. Um, thank you so much, <laughs> uh, Prof. Ted. Um, Abongile, over to you. Uh, good afternoon. I hope I'm audible. Um, yes, you are. Sorry, I was muted. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Kobani. Uh, good afternoon to everyone, and you know, thank you so much to the speakers who have spoken before me. Very insightful conversations. My name is Abongi Leng Amisa. I am a lawyer currently working at Open Secrets. So for the work that I did with Anthropology Southern Africa was uh, being part of a, a, a true call roundtable discussion you know, with a group of thinkers um, you know, discussing ideas around our experiences and our line of work uh, in relation to the COVID-19 pandemic. And I reflected on, you know, some of the experiences that I had as well as a, a candidate attorney at the time working in Joburg, uh, you know, being part of a public interest law organization that was, you know, primarily focused in, um, uh, you know, guarding against the violation of democracies and civil liberties, uh, you know, under uh, COVID-19. So, you know, the role of the law um, in the pandemic was very complex in that, you know, it was, it had positive uh, impacts, but it also had negative pitfalls as well in terms of how it was administered and, you know, the outcomes that we saw from that. So the first, you know, it starts with, you know, the government invoking the Disaster Management Act to enable, you know, an implement a quick implementation of, you know, mask mandates, social distancing, and, you know, all those related regulations. And um, that was, you know, important and pivotal because, you know, the state had to act in that way. And the constitution empowers, you know, uh, parliament in instances where there's emergency and disasters to take those executive decisions. So we also saw, you know, um, uh, you know, for the first time, uh, you know, social and economic relief measures in the form of grants, uh, the social relief grants that was targeted to a population of people who could not, um, you know, work as a result of the pandemic to have some sort of you know, income while people are locked away. And we also saw, you know, labor law protections around workers who could not be returned as a result of, you know, the COVID pandemic and its impacts and uh, the provision mandating uh, employers to provide employees with masks and um, ultimately leading up to, um, you know, the, the vaccine as well. Another element um, was, you know, the stay that the judiciary implemented when it came to evictions, primarily evictions, you know, in Joburg at that time affected the urban poor, you know, in the inner city of Joburg. 
So the law was, you know, quick to act into saying that, you know, no, no evictions were permitted in that period as a result of COVID-19. There was also, you know, an expanded access to healthcare services as a result because the aim was to curtail the spread and the impact of COVID-19. But in the same vein, you know, there was also like negative roles that the law uh, played or rather revealed, you know, pre-existing problems that were challenged with in South Africa. So the first one was the restricted and, you know, unequitable enforcement of law when it came to you know implementing and enforcing social distancing, uh, and we saw this a lot in you know poor um, uh, you know con you know, congested na neighborhoods and formal settlements as a result, and how they would implement uh, seek to implement you know uh, the, the the provisions of of of, of the disaster management act. And I think, you know, a point in case that we might all know um, is the case of um, Collins Corsa, a man who was brutally attacked by soldiers in the beach to enforce, you know, COVID-19 regulations that, you know, on its own really, um, you know, had us talking specifically in public interest law about, you know, is this something new or is it revealing something that, you know, we to some degree already know uh, in, in South African society around brutality, specifically targeting, uh, you know, people from impoverished backgrounds uh, or pe people who are of like low income or low wages. So, you know, um, ultimately that case was taken to court, but, you know, based on procedural technical reasons it did not you know go go any far but it did really raise you know important questions about policing and police brutality in black communities in low income communities and how they tend to want to enforce their power and they tend to want to implement you know the law through harassment and abuse you know and also the you know punitive measures that would be uh, you know people would be fined as a result um, but it was an ongoing trend that existed way before COVID-19. But, you know, COVID-19 sort of exposed these things and a lot more people were talking about, you know, uh, how these things were happening and people now could, you know, also engage and see uh, these ways. And um, another point uh, was also the unequal, you know, access to legal relief and services. As I said, uh, I was working for a public interest law organization at the time, and our primary focus is, you know, lending legal service assistance to those who cannot afford to otherwise. So we saw quite a lot of, um, we were dealing with quite a lot of cases at the time coming from, you know, urban areas, including rural areas. And in many instances, some of those cases, you had to let them go because there was not enough time and capacity to address everything as it was happening at the time. It revealed just how glaring, you know, unequal access to legal services is in this country, but also just in general, how, you know, public uh, interest organizations themselves are not fully capacitated to address all of these existing problems. You know, there are, you know, genuine, genuine constraints that exist within um, these organizations and how, you know, they plan to, to, to you know, to, to further, you know, legal access uh, and access to courts as a result of the violations that were happening. So that was really like an, an eye opener into um, how, you know, these dynamics play out, especially in times of emergencies. And I think um, another important point was also the lack of legal protections for informal workers. So as soon as, you know, the act was implemented, um, informal workers in the inner city of Johannesburg were moved or were removed from the streets, you know, uh, with the aim of implementing the act itself and what it required. And what that showed us was, you know, South African laws provided legal protection, no you know, did it seek to cater for those type of contexts for informal workers who make up a significant part of the economy in underserved communities. So informal traders and, you know, day laborers face devastating and income losses, uh, you know, that I think 
to some degree, people still have not really fully recovered from those from those um, uh, restrictions. Um, you know, you know, the informal sector in itself is largely unregulated. Um, it received little attention in emergency laws and being implicated for you know, leaving those workers without access to the social safety net extended to formerly employed individuals, which you know raises pertinent questions and understandings around what is you know law is supposed to look like and what it currently looks like, you know, and who does it serve and who does it cater in, in you know in those instances. So the discussion really was around um, those points with the with the roundtable discussion, and we really got to dive deep and you know discuss also you know other softer elements. In fact, let me, let me not even say softer, but less technical, less procedural elements that come with you know the pandemic or that came with the pandemic, such as you know a declined state of mental health and how that looked like. Um, we also discussed how, you know, gender-based violence as well was heightened in those instances and almost highlighted because for the first time in a long time, right, victims of gender-based violence were locked in with their abusers. And what that meant was that um, there was, you know, frequent, uh, you know, calls and requests from women reporting um aspects of gender-based violence, those who could, but in some instances, people died in the hands of their uh, intimate partners. Um, it was a distressing time really reflecting on these things, right? More than just them being a theory, because I, I doubt in a sense that had the lockdown not happened, I would have been exposed to the full length of what you know the law needs to account for the way that I did under uh, COVID-19, it really painted a vivid picture of some of the things that, you know, the law in itself needs to fix. Uh, um, I think, you know, from the very beginning, even the how the Disaster Management Act in itself was enacted was quite contentious. And, you know, there were ongoing debates about how, you know, the power that you know uh, government holds in in in, in enacting in, in emergency laws looks like and what it accounts and what it fails to account for and these things were highlighted in people living their everyday lives being confronted by soldiers who could you know abuse their power in the name of enforcing the law or you know in instances where the government is able to remove informal workers, you know, in Joburg, in a city, in the name of enforcing the law and what you know society needed at the time. So really, like grappling with all of these things um, and really trying to understand, um, you know, like what is the role of the law and how you know do I position myself in instances of this of of this nature. And I think it wasn't a really difficult question to answer because I was already involved in the work and I was already doing the work. But, you know, also just thinking about all of those people we could not assist and all of those people we could not, you know, attend to at the time because of capacity constraints. Um, yeah, it, it was an eye-opening experience. And I think, uh, you know, sitting here today and having this discussion is also just reflecting on some of the, you know, residue from the pandemic period where we sort of have to question the power of the executive in an enacting laws and how it does so and you know like when does it stop because we also saw instances of, of corruption around PPE or the supply of PPE and you know um, there wasn't really like any movement from there on because you know the government had been given so much power to implement and execute uh, who was guarding, you know, no, no, um, um, what this power would mean and what it would look like. Um, so it was quite interesting to to reflect, you know, from that perspective and to really look into time into what really in, impact COVID nineteen had in terms of how society then progressed afterwards and how the law also as well sort of shifted and moved, you know, after the pandemic. So um, I will stop there. Thank you so much.
Fantastic. Um, <clears throat> thank you so much, um, Abongile. And um, I want to also just acknowledge um, the, the colleagues that you were part of the roundtable with um, who couldn't make it. So um, Candice um, from Doctors Without Borders was supposed to also be here, but um, mm. she had a meeting she couldn't get out of. But I thought your roundtable was so important. I mean, it touched on, of course, what you've just mm -hmm. shared here, um, the legal aspects, but also issues um, of pharmaceuticals, um, which actually have not has been not have been discussed in popular imagination as they need to be, but they were so central in how we experienced um, um, the COVID pandemic, as Gagana said at the beginning, you know, issues of vaccine appetite, which country um, has the first access, which country, you know, are these vaccines tested on and so on. So it was such a rich discussion and I highly recommend um, anyone um, to, if you can, to please um, download it because um, th those discussions were so rich. Um, I won't ask you anything because I want us to get to Q&A to give people in the audience a chance, but there is a question for you in the chat. It says, is it possible to impl implement um, stringent laws that can alleviate the effects of the pandemic whilst being sensitive to the social needs of the pandemic? In the context of a pandemic, what matters most? Question, ensuring that people are happy or ensuring that people are safe? Or can it be both? Um, that's for you. And then we're going to go to Nozaga after you and then um, um, Q&A and then we'll close. Well, thank you so much for the question. Um, it's a, it's, you know, it's a deeply complex question, but it is very easy from where I'm standing as a social justice, you know, lawyer and human rights is that in every decision that the state makes, they must account and you know they must respect the constitution and what the constitution says so it is not a it's not a matter of you are trading off your social um you know liberties or rights as a person it, it's not a trade-off but it's a balancing act in which whatever decision the state makes it must account for um, whatever pitfalls come from that and you know people are still entitled to some level of respect or to some level of acknowledgement as the constitution requires. So yeah, like I said, it's not a trade off, but every law must be made in a constitutionally compliant manner. And our constitution is quite broad in terms of what is protected you know, in, in the Bill of Rights. We have a very progressive Bill of Rights that states clearly that you know none of these rules can be violated or none of these rights that people are entitled to can ever be violated because any law that seeks to do so would be, you know, unconstitutional. And in, term, in terms of emergencies, right, the government ought to move quicker. And what we see from there is that they do not take full account of, you know, some of these constitutional implications. And this is where we come in as you know, as a public interest law and social justice practitioners to say there is a way in which you could have enacted the same law that you're required to enact, but also taking into consideration some of these constitutional um, you know, implications that you cannot avoid. And you know, our role even during the pandemic was uh, you know, seriously about that. Like you cannot violate people in this manner you know, um, um, in the name of wanting to enforce a law, there is a way to do it that takes into full account, uh, you know, a person, a, a person's rights. So yeah, that yeah, I hope I hope I've captured everything that the question asked. Yeah. Wonderful. So just before we close, not now, but for the closing, I'm just I, this is for the panelists. But if you, I will ask you all to just in under two minutes each, um, your last final point. So if there's a point you wanted to stress that you might have forgotten, um, you will have an opportunity to 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 do that um, at the closing, and then we'll have Nozaka, and then after Nozaka, we're gonna open to the floor. If there are no questions from the floor, um, we're gonna go into closing um, final remarks for the for the from the panelists, and then we have a we can also have a short discussion about a potential um, book project that expands um, on the edited collection. Um, but that's for that's for later. Um, Nozaka, and then um, we'll go to Q and A. 
thank you so much um, for the opportunity. I um, I feel really privileged to have been able to hear everyone's submission um, and then be able to provide my own reflection. And I hope I can interweave some of the incredible things that I've managed to hear over the last hour and a half um, as effectively as possible. So for those of you who don't know me, Kamalami, uh, my stage name is Nozaga, um, but it is a consolidation of my first name and my middle name, which is Nokwanda Zakia, and my surname is Shabangu. So I'm born and bred Muslim, and I captured the photograph that was used um, on the cover for this incredible uh, issue. And that was done through the beautiful, I guess, vision that um, Dr. Gambela saw when, again, through this concept of this pandemic, when we're living through it, I had this longing of constantly being able to share the fact that I had lost my father. Um, and so I was like having conversations, you know, as we did and as we still do online. Um, and we were actually on, on Twitter or X, <clears throat> and we were part of a, another conversation. I can't remember what it is, but I'm pretty sure um, Dr. Gambella remembers. And I recall just reflecting on, 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 on my experience and the difficulty of having to bury a parent through COVID. And I, I told him and everyone else on the call that I actually took pictures and I tweeted them. <laughs> And um, Gobani was like, oh my God, please can I use this for a cover? And I was like, oh, okay, sure, you know? And sometimes you don't realize the immensity of your own experience until you're able to reflect on it with other people. And I think for me, that has really been at the epicenter of this work that I then had to do after just taking the photograph and after just talking about it and sharing it on Twitter, I then had to write about how I got to that point, how I took that photograph. And I think that's really where the difficulty came in for me because I've never had to reflect on my relationship with my father. And so a lot of what I heard, um, even from um, Prof um, Stadler at the beginning, <clears throat> is just the element of how this pandemic highlighted challenges that we've already always had. So the the, the, the trauma of growing up without my father, the fatherlessness, the hopelessness, um, that, that, that tragedy was highlighted in me having to take this photograph for the first time on my father's land, but during him being buried. And that for me was immense. And I actually realized that I was a reflection of what South Africa had become or what South Africa was and what black life was or what black life currently is. And it's difficult to come to terms with that using your own experience, because then you must reflect not from a theoretical point of view, but you must actually reflect from a realistic point of view and allow for yourself to use that process to not only reflect, but to also heal. And a lot of the times we don't give ourselves that opportunity because A, we don't give ourselves enough time to actually acknowledge what is happening, but then B, because it's so difficult to process once you've acknowledged it. So I would definitely say that this issue was, it formed part of my healing in many ways. Um, ways that I, I, I cannot articulate, but I have felt because I have done the work, because I had to do the work. I was communicating this challenge I had in isolation due to COVID-19, but that opened me up to a whole other world just by talking about it and just by sharing the art in it. And writing it actually helped me to remember that I'm actually an artist. Um, I think we get so caught up in capitalism. I mean, right now I'm at a conference and I had to find like a quiet space <clears throat> because we have to, we have to um, balance our income sheets. We have to meet our, our ends needs. We have to be able to inspire and support. And so it's very easy to put the fact that you're an artist to the, to the back and be like, okay, let me just do these things that I need to do so that I can actually be able to live somewhat of a meaningful life. And this process opened me up to the fact that, oh my God, babe, you are still an artist. You actually take great photographs, great enough that it could actually be able to encapsulate all of these 
amazing, amazing contributions and reflections and research and you in and of yourself in your difficulty and in your experience will always still showcase that as an artist and still be able to provide the lens that art must provide, which is to be that conduit for greater discourse. Um, and that is really the purpose of art. Yes, there's the element of entertainment, but even that is a form of education. It is a form of communication. So it, it turned me on to so many things, uh, things that I had forgotten about myself, things that I, I knew, uh, things that I didn't know that I needed to know. <clears throat> and I'm really grateful for it. I think I'd really love to highlight not just the trauma and the tragedy and the violence on black lives, but the element that going through COVID-19 also allowed me to be exposed to indigenous knowledge systems that I had perhaps not been aware of. And while writing this and also by constantly trying to heal um, from losing my dad, I actually realized that I was more spiritually connected than I thought I was. And it's, it's, it's an ideology that we don't tend to explore a lot um, in the academic sphere because it's very difficult to transcribe or transpose uh, spiritual energy, you know. <clears throat> um, but I was fortunate enough, I am still fortunate enough to be privileged and to have been able to have the internet connectivity, to have the ability to stop working just to heal and to sit and to reflect and to listen. And as a result of decluttering and, I guess, decoupling myself from the system, I was able to find my own sense of alignment and to root myself and ground myself in a sense that I then became more spiritually alert and more aware of the indigenous knowledge that I carry within myself. And this concept of us seeing during COVID when police would go into people's homes and spill their traditional beers because, you know, uh, this is not something that we should be doing was one that started to affect me in ways that I wasn't aware of. So today I was even wearing a mask because um, I'm coughing. <clears throat> and I, I mean, I didn't do it on purpose, but I always carry a mask in my bag and I always wondered to myself, do I carry a mask out of fear? Do I carry a mask out of greater knowledge because we come from COVID-19? Or do I carry it um, out of the fact that lives were lost when people were not wearing masks? I still don't have an answer for it, but every single day in my car, in my bag, I will have a mask. And if someone's coughing really badly next to me, I'll get a disposable one and I'll hand it to them and I'll say, please, can you mask up, you know? And maybe it's because I lost my dad. Um, and maybe that's what I actually needed to also just take certain steps for myself a little bit further. So there was this wholeness that came from the loneliness. Um, there was this hopelessness that was reflected, but also there was then this potential to not just heal, but to see what to do with this healed self, this healed version of myself. And for the first time in my life, having a very difficult and estranged relationship with my father, I was able to forgive him for being a black South African man. <laughs> um, and I was able to say to myself, there's a world beyond the reality that we see and that we know. And shortly after I lost my dad, I fell pregnant, um, which for me in the indigenous knowledge context really does speak to the element of death and rebirth really being part of one spectrum. And having left my dad's burial site uh, a few months after we had to do um, a certain ritual, I realized that I actually carried him in my womb and I was looking for a seed to now bring this energy into the world again. And that was life changing. And that's not something I was even able to reflect in the, in the article because I mean, how do you even say to people, I lived with my dad's energy guys. I carried my dad in my room for a solid three months. <laughs> and, then, um, and, then, and then I had this really beautiful, amazing human being who's a very old man. Like my almost three year old is a very old man. He's hilarious. And I love that because I have a different interpretation of how I am now raising my father. 
and how I have now been able to give to him the love that I not only wanted for myself, but that he also deserved himself in his own right, and that he was denied of for various socioeconomic reasons and the violence of blackness uh, that perpetuated itself into what became me in 2020 at that time. So yeah, I think that's really highlights top level everything, but the art speaks for itself. Uh, and I'm really grateful that I took my camera and I used it as a medium to process what I was going through. And I used my body as this vessel and I grounded myself and I had privileges. I cannot say this and not acknowledge the fact that I could stop. I could literally stop and think and feel, which a lot of people aren't able to do. And for those who were privileged enough, COVID did give us that sense. And that really is where we had to use that and see where is the hope? Uh, where do we funnel that hope? Where do we use what has come before us, which is really difficult, uh, and channel that into something positive? So I'm really grateful. Thank you so much for allowing me the opportunity to not only capture this, uh, but to share and to listen and to learn. Uh, uh, no Nokwanda, you, you are always such a gift. Um, thank you so much. Thank you so so much. I think Prof Stedler has already written in the in the comment section, but I I've and I've said to you this too many times. I there are no words to describe. Um it almost feels wrong to say the gift that you gave us, but it is a gift um, um with those images um and for your personal essay. And I'm glad I hounded you and hounded you and up until you <laughs> up until you 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 submitted it. Um because it is, I think it it is a tough essay to read. I know someone who also read it and they said they felt a little even uncomfortable because they were inside um your thoughts. Um they were in they could feel the ways in which you were grappling um with the loss of your father. Um so thank you so so much. I think like for me, as I I, I said to Prof Stedler and the people in the editorial theme, this wouldn't have been a complete issue um, with that essay. And in many ways, we actually start with your father um, at the beginning and we end with you. And I think that's a um, a metaphor for what you've literally just said um, of, of, you know, starting with that image and ending with this beautiful um, healing piece. Um, from you so thank you so much we don't have a lot of time so i will not put you on the spot and ask you questions for now but we'll 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 come to you there are also questions on the chat specifically for prof stedler and um prof powers but we won't go to that um there's um zikona who hasn't spoken because um I, and i want to give zikona a chance because your piece is also with your colleagues quite important because it it takes us into the impact of COVID-19 on rituals and, and in many ways builds from um, Nokwanda's work in, in terms of really going into our intimate spaces. So I, I this will not be a complete chat um, without um, those contributions from you, um, Zikona. So Zikona, over to you, and then we'll go to the Q&A and the final closing statements from, from panelists. Um, good afternoon, colleagues. My video is on. Okay, hi. So sorry for being so late, but I literally just came out of a meeting now. Okay, um, I just caught the last part of Nogwanda's um, reflection. Okay, so the article that I contributed and with my other colleagues, it was really, again, thank you for the opportunity, Prof Q. So we, we talk about um, rituals within the South um South Africa, um, Southern Africa context, that is. So the idea came from me wanting to also explore what really changed in terms of how we performed rituals, um, more specifically burial rituals, but also coming of age rituals. As Um Kosa from the Eastern Cape, I saw that a lot of the way we did things changed during um, COVID-19. And so the, the article, again, is also our experiences and interviews that we did with people in our communities. So we do have a reflection from myself being Um, I spoke in the, in the, in the article, 
I remember there was a part where I was talking about even some of my family members, we were reflecting on how we had to bury a, um, a family member, but then not in the dignified or respective way as before. And for us, it's not just about putting the person six feet down, but it's also about accompanying their spirit. So also I know in Lesotho, uh, Boibano also talks in her section of the article about how they buried um, the dead cold which is very important for us, I guess, also in South Africa, in a sense of um, giving a person a burial that's like with dignity. And we know there were a lot of procedures during the COVID-19. And so Lesotho and the example I gave from my own traditional um, South African example, very much spoke to the idea of burying the dead cold. And I think that carried that carries the article throughout in terms of how um, Tulani also speaks about the funeral procedures that um, now had to be changed and sort of reimagined because of COVID-19. Like, I know he extensively talks about what, um, under the different regulations, what we had, and also how then, again, we had to redefine that and had to re-understand that, that it's not just about getting a coffin and getting professional diggers to come and dig, but then there's also like a politics behind it. And then in the same breath, Chanda then in the same article talks about um, the landscape in Zambia, more specifically about burying the elite, which is, um, we don't talk about um, just about normal people, but we also talk about the politics of burying um, former ministers, because again, we have this thing of a state funeral, whereas you can't have a state, we couldn't have state funerals during that time, but then rules were being bent to accommodate those um, state funerals. So there's a lot of con contestations that in Zambia that we saw with the article. So um, Chanda also speaks a lot about that. And also the symbolism it is that they had to lose, sort of like in Lesotho of burying their dead cold, like not wrapping the blanket because you had to adhere to certain procedures. So in Zambia, I know they've got this very powerful ritual where they just, I want to say spray, but like they just, they use white powder on you. And that in its sense, it also, again, it carries the dignity of a person to the other realm, right? And so essentially also Tamiya talks about the, um, in her last section of the article, it's more about on the midwifery, the, the, which is basically, she talks about from the Johannesburg um, point of view in terms of, practices in within midwife so i feel like she ends the article in a way that takes it back to also medical anthropology if i may actually use that term in terms of how even during covid that had to be redefined but also it didn't mean that it lost its true essence because again people who have carried that type of midwifery within the colored community still did it in that way because throughout the years it didn't necessarily change so government structures of different codes of regulations, yes, they were in place, but they are still core traditional practices that still stayed. And I think the article bringing these different nuances from different South African, um, Southern African regions rather, taking it from Lesotho to Zambia to even South Africa and also burial practices, which is what Tulani focuses on. And then ending the, 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 the paper with what Tamiya goes back and says, actually guys, Yes, it has changed. Yes, we've got, we've had regulations. Yes, we have had contestations in terms of how we bury our dead. But then look at this community that has always done things this way. And irregardless of this new way of living that we had to undergo because of COVID-19, there still remains that. Yes, we, 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 we felt like we were policed. Yes, there was a certain governmentality that was pushed because we talk a lot about how it has become politicized. It's no longer about burying the dead with dignity, but rather what the government says of it, right? So, and I think, um, I know of the feedback I've gotten of the article is that it was very um, nuanced in the sense of how you, we weaved in the different perspectives. Yes, they spoke to different um, audiences or rather different regions, but then the way the article ended is beautifully to say that we can't just say that, yes, we had to reimagine and talk about it in a different way 
we needed to look at it from a point of our practices, our burial practices, our rites of passages, again, as Umkosa. I know whenever I went to Umgidi, it was not the same. But then at the end of the day, we still did perform an essence of it. So um, I'm not sure if there's any other prompt I haven't spoken to. But the article pretty much, again, is really reflections from emerging scholars and how they viewed um, COVID-19 on the whole burial and ritual um, processes that we had to now redefine to rather fit our new norm. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Zikoda. You packed in so much in, in such little time. We don't have a lot of time. We literally have nine minutes left. Um, and I do understand people have to, you've been with us for nearly two hours now, and people do have to to go. So I'm going to um, um, go straight. I'm going to ask um, the panelists to just um, please literally min a minute and a half at maximum. Um, if you can give us some of your final thoughts or, or conclusions, Prof Stedler and um, um, Prof Ted, you also had um, some questions in the chat, so if you can also address those. But before we go to 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 the panelists, I just want to also say I forgot I should have mentioned this right at the beginning that you know although the special issue has been out for um, about five months now, it's actually already prescribed at nearly five uni well at five universities that I know of. Um, it's prescribed at Stellenbosch, um, Sol Blatty University, of course, UJ, um, University of Pretoria and others. So I think that shows, um, I mean, the kind of demand um, and the kind of reception that people have had to all of your contributions um, in that work. I'm going to put Prof Stedler on the spot. There's a new series that um, UNISA Press is launching on, literally on Monday. So I'm speaking there together with my other colleague, um, Dr. Taminda Kao um, and a couple of other people. And I really want to pitch um, an expansion of this um, special issue um, into an edited book collection. So I will probably be emailing you um, sometime uh, about that, but it's open to everyone who contributed. But of course, um, even attendees, as we will probably have to expand it and not just republish um, the issue. But I just wanted to say, I think from, we've heard from the contributions today how rich all of um, all of you all um, have 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 been. Even um, I think the spirit of collaboration, whether with Zikona, you know, in your article, at least three Southern African countries are represented. Dr. Jimmy and Ted, U.S. and America. We have, you know, so much um, so much to 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 pull from, and I think we could do. Um, a really proper edited book um, collection. I'll be in touch about that. So um, just be, just uh, out of the interest of respecting everyone's time, I'm going to ask, um, I'm going to literally um, go with whoever is at the top. So it's Abongile, Kekana, Nozaka, Prof Stedler, Talent, uh, Prof Ted, and then Zikona, you are last. <laughs> and then we'll, we'll, we'll close the, the session. Okay, um, Abongile. So I'm supposed to provide the last re reflections. Yes. Um, I think in a lot of ways, COVID-19, you know, in as much as I spoke about the pitfalls that came about as a result, it really also empowered and strengthened our, our resolve in, in pushing, you know, um, the discussions that are affecting the poor. Um, so, for example, the, the SRP grant is still something that is in place. And you know the discussion of how we can, you know, create a universal access to social assistance, specifically for people who are currently unaccounted for um, in terms of getting, you know, social security assistance. So those are some of the successes that were, you know, sort of initiated by uh, the demands and the needs of the COVID pan pandemic. You know, still in, in a similar vein, we are, you know, struggling with. Um, powers or like, uh, you know, uh, executive acting unrestrained as a result of the powers they had um, under COVID-19. But, you know, really being excited as well for some of the, you know, social adv advancements that are, are, you know, sort of like fell, fell over um, from, from, from the pandemic. So, yeah. Fantastic. Thank you, uh, Abongile uh, Kekan. Um, thank you. Uh, I don't really have much to say, but to be hopeful that these reflections and this contribution can be influential in how we approach pandemics um, in the future. Thank you.
Fantastic, short and sweet. Um, Nozaka? Yeah, I mean, what can I say after Kekana? Uh, makes sense why his article is the most downloaded. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I don't think I can thank you enough. The work that goes into documenting some of these processes is what allows us to continue to have conversations and not sweep it under the rug as if it didn't happen. Because that really is what begins to cause these cancerous elements that we hold within ourselves. Um, so this cross pollination and this intergenerational and intercontinental conversation that we've just been able to encapsulate uh, really is a testament to the type of world we should be striving to live towards. So I'm just grateful to be part of this. Wonderful. Uh, Prof Stedler? Yes, thanks very much for this opportunity to just say a couple of things. Um, I had questions asked about Pandemics and social suffering and stuff, and I think that that's quite a long conversation. But um, one of the things that's really struck me, especially with the participants talking about burial and customary sort of practices, and in in in, in finalizing death, is and this comes slightly from a conversation I've been having with Jos Fontaine in his The Politics of the Dead. Um, is the unresolved nature of death uh, that I've, I've also written about in terms of the AIDS epidemic is something which is really striking about the COVID epidemic and the, the, the kind of sense that the dead have actually not really been put to sleep, put to rest uh, effectively um, in both situations because of the severe social suffering and the failure that we of us to properly bury and this sort of raises a question of in, in me is sort of are we going to sort of face a situation where the dead sort of are reanimated i'm not talking about actually physically reanimated but are they you know are they going to sort of emerge again in public discourse um, around the fact that we didn't actually do the proper things when we buried them so that's just a question I have like hanging um, for future discussion and, and interest. Thanks very much for that. Wonderful. Thank you, um, Prof. Um, talent? Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh... Thank you, Prof Q. So I think generally what uh, the pandemic it has taught us a lot of things in terms of understanding the urgency of individuals within societies, uh, particularly uh, nowadays uh, with the intersection of technology and so forth and how people were able to navigate in terms of uh, the whole thing uh, as, uh, as societies. And as compared to, to, to other pandemics, like what uh, Prof started uh, when he, he gave us his, uh, his first when he addressed it, when he started here. So I, I think we are a bit advantaged in a way in terms of how we're going to deal with other diseases because we are better equipped, especially technologically and so forth, and other aspects that we have learned uh, uh, during this, uh, this era. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Talent. And then uh, Prof Powers. Thanks again for this wonderful opportunity to, to everyone uh, to kind of share, share in this way. Um, I'm going to try and close with a way of, of addressing both the questions and, and my reaction uh, to some of this. Nozaka's really moving, moving comments uh, speak to what inspired me to write Sustaining Life, which is you know, how can it be that, you know, we cannot treat all with their full humanity? You know, how can it, how can this be like how we live? And, and what is it that, that we can do to counteract these tendencies in, in, in South African society, but, but elsewhere? And, and the privilege of working with the AIDS activists of the South African HIV AIDS movement inspired me to, to write that book, inspired me uh, with the gift that they gave me of sharing their experiences, opening their lives to me, uh, and also to think about how they transformed the state, they occupied the state to sustain life. And perhaps there's, 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 there's aspects of, of what they were able to accomplish that 
did not end the pandemic of HIV AIDS in Southern Africa, but maybe can inspire us to think about how we might build the world otherwise by working with one another and trying to live and treat others in their full humanity. Beautiful. Um, Zikona, you have the last word. <laughs> okay, I'll be brief. So continue it, continuity and discontinuity of rituals, just from our article and my last words, is that it leaves me, as a person who's constantly been reading this piece, it leaves me with an ambiguous, I'm very confused. I was very confused while we were even writing this article. I was. It leaves me with an ambiguous feeling of one of hope and also one of like i'm hopeful that we 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 digni we buried our dead with dignity but also it's the continuity of the state or the government in enforcing a type of regulation it also reminds me that in as much as things change in as much as we have these pandemics they still remain the same we're still obligated to government mandates we're still obligated to re um to regulations but i'm hopeful so hence, I'm leaving it with some optimism. So I don't want to be, um, I don't want to depress in everyone. So I'm just leaving my last words to you guys, to the room, is that have that two sides to a coin. Yes, things have changed, but they still ha somehow have remained the same. And I think as we continue with life, we should just always be mindful of that, that in as much as things change, they still remain the same. Thank you, Prof. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, thank you so much, um, uh, Zikona and everyone else. Um, if we were in person, I'd say let's take a group photo, but we're not. So I'm going to take a screenshot of all of us. The people who are attending have allowed your camera. So if you want to switch on your camera in the next five seconds, um, please do. And then we're going to take a nice smiley uh, screenshot in lieu of being in person <laughs> together. OK, are you ready? One, two, three. OK, smile. <laughs> Okay, I took a lot. Thank you so much, um, everyone. Um, and as I said, I'm going to be in touch about the UNISA series. Uh, they're doing a 30 years series uh, that's being launched on Monday. So hopefully we can pitch this to them in an expanded form. I understand not everyone might be able to contribute, but um, let's see what we can dream up for the for the next step. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, have a great um, Thursday. Who's a Thursday if you pose have something. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. <Cheers>. <laughs> Thank you.